Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nirav Shaw. I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I am delighted this afternoon to be joined by Commissioner Randy Liberty from Maine's Department of Corrections, Commissioner Jean Lambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Liberty, Commissioner Lambrew and I are pleased to be able to join everyone today to provide an update on all things COVID-19 across the state of Maine for today, Thursday, October 29th, 2020. I'll start by providing an update on the epidemiology of COVID-19 across the state of Maine, then turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew before we turn to our colleagues in the media for questions. Overall, right now across the state, there are a total of 6,467 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 80 total cases since yesterday. Of those, 5,749 are confirmed, an increase of 79 confirmed cases, and 718 are probable, an increase of one probable case. Overall, 483 people have been hospitalized at some point, 31 people have been hospitalized in the past 30 days, and right now in Maine, 15 people are currently in the hospital, five of whom are in the ICU, two of whom are on ventilators. That's an increase of two people who are on ventilators since yesterday alone. 146 have been, individuals have passed away with COVID-19, the same number as it has, has been for several days now, and 5,462 individuals have recovered an increase of 21 recoveries since yesterday. Our cases also include 1,154 healthcare workers, an increase of 10 healthcare workers since yesterday. In terms of our metrics around testing, the current seven day positivity rate in Maine stands at 0.8%. To put that number in perspective, one week ago, the positivity rate in Maine was 0.53%, and two weeks ago, the positivity rate was 0.42%. Nationwide, the national positivity rate is approximately 6.3%, but our positivity rate in Maine alone has nearly doubled from 0.42 to 0.8 in just two weeks. Our testing volume for PCR tests in Maine is at 470 tests for every 100,000 people. That testing volume is back near the all-time high point, and that's a good thing. It shows and suggests that we have the capacity to identify new cases and take public health action with them before there is too much spread. I'd like to turn next to provide an update on some outbreaks. We'll first start with some new outbreak investigations that Maine CDC has opened. One of which is at the Pat's Pizza location in the Old Port in Portland, where we have traced a total of 10 cases to that location. Most of the cases are amongst guests. And we've identified two particular evenings where there seems to have been a high degree of transmission. One on October 16th, and another evening on October 22nd. If you were at the Pat's Pizza in the Old Port on either October 16th or October 22nd, please consider getting tested. If you were at that location on either evening and you have symptoms, please make sure you reach out to your healthcare provider before you arrive at their office to inform them of your possible exposure to COVID-19. Others who have attended Pat's Pizza on evenings other than those two may have also been exposed. If you are feeling any symptoms whatsoever, again, please consider getting tested and reaching out to your healthcare provider to alert them of your possible exposure before you go to the office so that you can avoid exposing other people. Another outbreak investigation that Maine CDC has opened is into the Durgan Pines facility in York County where we are aware of one resident and two staff who have tested positive. This being a nursing facility, Durgan Pines has been undertaking peri periodic universal testing of all of their staff. 
And that is the mechanism through which Maine CDC became aware of these cases at that facility. I'd like to next turn to an update on some of the open outbreak investigations that Maine CDC has been involved with. At the Woodland Memory Care Facility, there are a total of 21 cases, 19 of which are among residents, two of which are among staff. We anticipate that there is a likelihood of additional cases at this facility as additional test results become known, in part because of the unique vulnerability of the residents at this facility. At the Second Baptist Church in Callis, we are now aware of 27 cases associated with that facility. And in the larger outbreak in and around Waldo County, initially associated with the Brooks Pentecostal Church, the case count there remains steady at 60 cases. Before I turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew, I'd like to provide a bit of analysis on the, around the new cases that Maine CDC has reported today. First, let's take a step back. Over the past five days in Maine, we have recorded 329 cases of COVID-19 just in the past five days. Of the 80 cases that we are talking about today, 28% were from Cumberland County, 18% were from Somerset County, and 15% are from York County. Somerset County in particular is especially worrying. On top of seven new cases there yesterday, they have logged 19 new cases today, 26 new cases in just two days. What's important and concerning in Somerset County is that there is no new outbreak investigation in any facility in that county, let alone one that accounts for the increase of 26 cases in two days. To put that differently, based on what we know right now, this is strong evidence of community transmission all throughout Somerset County. In Somerset County alone, the age range of new cases just today ranges from a low of nine years all the way up to 87 years. And two of the cases are among children under 18. The average age of cases in Somerset County is 60 at this time. Let me take a, let me zoom out one notch and talk about all of the cases that Maine CDC is reporting on in the past 24 hours, those 80 new cases. 10 of those are among healthcare workers who work in nine different locations. Another 10 cases are in nine different schools across Maine. None of the cases is in a childcare facility. And what's equally concerning, and what I want to take a moment to discuss, is that of these 80 cases, not one is associated with an outbreak that we are aware of. To be sure, we are beginning our investigation process, and we may, going forward, associate some of these new cases with new or existing outbreaks. But based on our initial look in, in the assignment of these investigations, not one is associated with a known outbreak. Of the cases, the average age of the cases that we're talking about just today, those 80 cases, the average age is 40. But again, the range goes from a low of five years all the way up to 87 years. And 13 of today's new cases are among individuals less than 18 years of age. More concerningly, just in the cases we're talking about today, there have been cases in 13 counties. Just in the past two days, we've logged new cases in 15 of Maine's 16 counties, just in the past 48 hours. To put all of this in perspective, what we are seeing right now in Maine is sustained, forceful, and widespread community transmission across the entire state. For weeks now, we've talked about what we were seeing on the horizon in other states. That is now here, squarely, right in front of us in Maine. It's not coming, it's not on its way, and it's not brewing. 
It is here. And unfortunately, based on the epidemiological data, the trajectory that we are sadly on will continue. Much of the rise in new cases continues to be driven by small indoor gatherings. So here's the bottom line. If you're gathering indoors with other people for hours, talking in a room with poor ventilation, with poor mask wearing, people in that room will get infected if even if only one person in that gathering comes to the room with COVID-19. What you can do right now to keep yourself and your family and your community safe is of course wear face coverings and maintain physical distance. But when you're gathering with others in small groups, even in households, what you can do right now is to shorten the duration of the visit, make sure that everyone is wearing a face covering, open windows to increase ventilation, and do what you can to lower the risk of any type of transmission event occurring. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Today, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services is announcing its strategy to distribute 400,000 rapid COVID-19 antigen tests to ensure access for Maine residents. The test can detect coronavirus infection from a nasal swab sample in approximately 15 minutes. Maine has already built a robust and successful testing strategy that helps us lead the nation in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The addition of the Binex Now rapid antigen tests will provide a new layer of protection for Maine people. These tests are for people with symptoms of COVID-19. We are also initially will test people at elevated risk of exposure to and illness from COVID-19 who are critical infrastructure staff. This means healthcare workers, law enforcement, and public safety personnel, first responders, and school staff. This also includes correctional facilities, which Commissioner Liberty can talk about. The federal government is distributing the Abbott Binex Now COVID-19 point of care antigen tests to all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Maine expects to receive 400,000 of these tests by December. We are newly partnering with Walgreens to distribute the bulk of the tests, approximately 300,000, through 65 pharmacy locations from Kittery to Madawaska. This testing will be available to the public at no charge at drive-through sites starting in November. Remaining 100,000 Binex Now tests will be distributed through an application process. Any qualified organization that follows the state's guidance may apply now for an allocation. The department will prioritize facilities that will use them for high-risk populations in high-risk settings or where access to COVID-19 testing is otherwise limited. In addition to the 400,000 tests allocated to Maine, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has also distributed these Binex Now tests directly to congregate care settings, such as nursing and assisted living facilities throughout the state. Even without accounting, though, for these Binex Now tests, Maine's testing capacity leads the nation. This capacity, which is 528% of Maine's testing target, according to the Harvard Global Health Institute, is the result of a deal Governor Mills reached with Maine-based IDEX laboratories about five months ago. That agreement, as well as partnerships with Maine healthcare organizations and exceptional work by the state's health and environmental testing laboratory, allows Maine to be one of the first states in the nation to eliminate its testing prioritization. We also have a standing order that allows anyone in Maine who thinks they need a test to get one. Maine has established more than two dozen swab and send testing locations that offer molecular testing at no charge. Swab and send sites complement the roughly 40 sites throughout the state that are available to the public. For a list of where you can get tested, go to the Keep Maine Healthy website. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Shaw. Great, thank you, Commissioner Wambrew. Uh, we'll now turn to our colleagues in the, in the media to take any questions. Commissioner Liberty, Commissioner Wambrew, and I are happy to answer any questions Thanks to Commissioner Liberty for being here to discuss any questions that may arise 
in connection with the Department of Corrections. First question for the afternoon goes to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thanks so much for taking my question. So two questions today. The first is you've been warning us for a while now that a second surge was coming. It's here. It's not good. Is there more that we could have done to prevent this surge or was this really inevitable? Um, Allison, I, it, it's difficult to say in retrospect. Um, you know, on, on one hand, uh, there were signs, but I don't know that the, the question, of course, is not so much whether, but in some respects, when. So although Maine started in an extremely favorable position and is able because of the testing architecture we've already stood up and the expansion of testing that Commissioner Lambrew just noted, it doesn't mean that this surge is any less challenging for us. When you're dealing in a pandemic, it's so easy to look back and say there's always something more we could have done. The fact is Maine people have done a lot. They've already made a significant number of sacrifices, and those are the sacrifices that have gotten us to where we are. I think going forward, Allison, the question is not so much looking backwards, but looking into the future, what can we do now? And to me, by my lights, the things that are the most essential for us to focus on right now are wearing face coverings and maintaining physical distance, especially when we're in small groups and bubbles. One of the things that I'm concerned about is that as I've talked to friends and family of mine, they talk a lot about their bubbles. When I talk to them and ask them more about their bubbles, what I realize is that their bubbles are getting so big that I'm worried that they're gonna burst. I think we all need, we need to take a hard look at who we're gathering with, and especially when we're indoors in places that have not less than adequate ventilation, making sure we're wearing face coverings. Right. And Donald Trump Jr. is holding an event at the Calvary Chapel today. Will there be any consequences if the CDC guidelines are not followed at this campaign event? And have you had any contact with the church that's holding this event? We have shared our guidance on public health and large gathering with the facility hosting the event. We expect them for the sake of public health to comply but we don't yet want to speculate on what that event will entail. It is possible and it has been proven, proven possible here in Maine that you can hold events, large gatherings safely. We urge them to follow that guidance and hope that they do. Great, thank you. Before I turn to the next question, I would like to issue a very quick correction. I misspoke a moment ago. I apologize for that. I want to correct the record immediately. Um, I indicated that there were 21 cases at Woodland Memory Care, with apologies to everybody. The correct number is 12, not 21. I misspoke. My apologies for that, but I wanted to immediately correct that error and correct the record. With that, I will turn next to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew, a question for you. Can you tell us a little about the interaction that you had with the Herman business that was set to host the Don Jr. rally? And what, if anything, you said would happen if they exceeded safety guidelines? Sure. So as a reminder, we deal with all businesses, all organizations in the same way. When we are asked for guidance, we provide it. When we hear of large gatherings, we provide information on how to do so safely. When we heard about the event yesterday in Herman and Bangor, we did uh, write a letter and indicated what our guidance is and urged them for the sake of public health to comply. That's the same approach we've taken with different types of businesses, be it people planning weddings or other large gatherings. It's no different because this is not about politics. This is about public health. When these things have come and gone in the past and you found about, out about them after the fact have uh, similar things happened or actions have been taken after the, the events have been held? Look, I, I don't want to speculate on um, whether or not this event will or will not be in compliance with the public health guidance. We urge both those organizing it to look hard at what they can do to protect the people attending. And we urge all those individuals who are going, wear a face covering, stay far apart from the people next to you, especially if they're yelling, because we know that when people project their voices, they are more likely to transmit um, those droplets of saliva that could carry uh, COVID-19. 
I'm sorry. I actually what meant previous events that have happened uh, after you found out about them have actions been taken where they've been held. Uh, I think people are familiar with the Big Moose Inn where there was a wedding reception. At that wedding reception, the capacity limits were exceeded. There were other challenge or lack of compliance with some of our guidance. We did uh, issue an imminent health hazard to that facility. It was temporarily shut down. They looked at that guidance. They adapted their practice and they reopened. So yes, we have we have taken action after the fact. And Dr. Shaw, I'm sorry, one for you real quick. Um, you just talked about small gatherings. It is Halloween this weekend, sort of a, a very popular small or large gathering event. I know that there's guidelines on the CDC website about how to do so safely, but if people are going to trick or treat or give out candy, uh, what advice would you give them as they head into what has traditionally been a, uh, you know, I guess a festive weekend in a non-pandemic? Yep. Right, it is a festive weekend. It's, you know, it's, it's it, and we should recognize that. Halloween can be done safely. And my recommendation is for folks to take a good look at the guidance. The guidance spells out the best ways, the safest ways for folks to celebrate Halloween. But Brian, I'll tell you what's on my mind, which is I think what we've all not recognized is that there are really two types of celebrations that occur on Halloween. One is the trick or treating with our families going down up and down the street. But Halloween is also a time for older folks to get together and celebrate. Those are the gatherings that I'm really worried about. Those are the ones that this weekend groups may be gathering at friends' houses. That's the ones that I think really we, where we need to be careful. Those are the ones, those small gatherings where unbeknownst to anybody, COVID-19 could be a part of those parties. That's where I really want everyone to wear a face covering when they're hanging out at their friend's house with their neighbors. Those are the places that I'm particularly concerned about right now. Uh, I'm going to turn to Rebecca Stefanski at News Center next. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, first, about testing uh, and the new rapid tests or existing rapid tests. Um, is there any concern over false negatives with that? And with PCR tests, what is the optimal time uh, after potential exposure um, for accurate results? Um, Rebecca, I'm glad you raised that. So with any type of test, no matter the test, there is always a possibility that there may be some false positives and false negatives. The Binax now, the, it, although there have been some false negatives that have been reported, the concern that we actually have with this test, and by we, I mean the public health community nationwide, is actually more around the false positives. False negatives can occur, but those are rare. And that, what I mean by that is that a negative result on this test is something that is dependable. It's something that we know with a high degree of certainty is a truly negative result. False positives, however, introduce a slightly different set of concerns. That's one reason that we are recommending to those who receive and use this test that anyone who tests positive with this result get a confirmatory PCR test just to make sure we are not missing somebody who might actually be positive. With respect to the optimum time frame, the US CDC recommends that somebody be tested approximately five to seven days after COVID-19 exposure. That's the time in which the level of the virus is the highest and, the, and has the best likelihood to be detected and not be missed by a diagnostic test. Okay, and then my other question is, uh, sort of anecdotally, but, uh, many people might not think that catching COVID is that serious and you'll recover, and many people do, um, and certainly it's dangerous for some people, um, but seven months in, do we have, or eight months, do we have information about what the long-term effects might be that might make people a little bit more leery and compliant with safety guidelines? And I guess without being confrontation and with kindness, what can we do to ask our friends, family, neighbors to comply when maybe they're not getting great information from other sources or um, you know haven't listened to you? <laughs> so not about me by any means, but I'll, let me start and then invite uh, Commissioner Wambrew and Commissioner Liberty weigh in if they wish. 
Uh, with respect to the first question, uh, Rebecca, there are data that are emerging on some of the longer term effects of having COVID-19. Uh, I, I happen to have the privilege of just being on a call two nights ago where there's a working group that has been meeting to start characterizing this and make sure that the data are being collected when, with a methodologically appropriate manner. So we're not just getting anecdotes. So we're getting robust representative data. And the early findings are concerning. Some individuals suffer from longer term respiratory uh, illnesses. Their lungs are just never able to recover. Some individuals have suffered longer term cardiac implications. Their heart just gets really beaten up by COVID. Others who go into COVID with poorer health, those who have diabetes or asthma, are particularly at risk for these longer term consequences. Given that we're really only about 10 months into our experience with COVID across the world, it's going to take a little bit longer for those data to be developed, but the, the early signs suggest that the long-term consequences of COVID are not to be trifled with, to say nothing of the short-term consequences. Rebecca, your second question is one that's really near and dear to me. I wanna start by saying this. Approaching individuals who don't see the world the same way you do with a sledgehammer of facts is rarely an opportunity or rarely produces a changing of someone's mind. Usually, in fact, what it does is drives a bigger wedge between one person and another. What I recommend that folks do when they encounter someone in their friends, their family, their neighbors, who doesn't see the world of COVID the way that they do, is not to go at them with a the sledgehammer of facts, but to ask them a simple question, which is, why do you believe what it is you believe? What are the sources of information that you go to? I think the question here is not so much to get people to believe what we believe or to get people to agree with our worldview. It's to go beyond diatribes and get to dialogue. And the best way to go about that is to ask them not what they believe, but why they believe it. That's the way you can actually go about having fruitful discussions that might actually change people's minds. If you go at them with the sledgehammer, all, on all likelihood, they're not going to believe you. And in fact, the data show they're going to harden their views even more. So the question is not so much what people believe, but why they believe it. That's where I think there can be fruitful dialogue where we can actually identify what we all agree on and then focus on the areas where we may disagree. It's not easy, it takes work, but that's where real dialogue happens. And I'll just add that the other one another tactic is not just ask why, tell why. Why do you behave, make change your behavior? Why are you wearing the mask? Why are you staying distance? Why are you asking people coming into your home to maybe sit a little bit further? I think this kind of dialogue is two way, and I think that your own stories, communicating why you're doing what you're doing, is also an effective means to try to have people think it's a community. I'm going to turn next to Evan Pop at the Main Beacon. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, not sure who this question is for, but um, someone can jump in. Um, so the New York Times reported yesterday that the FBI, um, DHHS, and Homeland Security have warned um, hospital administrators about a credible uh, threat of cyber attacks to American hospitals by Russian hackers who successfully breached a hospital network last month. And so I'm wondering if state government has been briefed about those threats and are there um, actions that um, state government could take to address those threats? So the state of Maine did receive that information via the Maine Emergency Management Association and other channels. We have circulated information on what healthcare facilities can do to protect themselves to the different associations throughout the state of Maine. We are also looking at our own state-run facilities to make sure that we're safe from a cybersecurity basis. It is nothing to fool with. We recognize that people's health information and data are private, they are valuable, so we are taking all available steps to protect people in Maine. And um, what, what is that kind of guidance that hospitals can, can do to protect themselves? Is that sort of publicly available information yes. or is that? It's publicly available. We're happy to share it with you. There are some basic tips that uh, organizations can follow. I probably would not do them justice trying to remember them off the top of my head, but we're happy to share those with you. Great. Um, and then a, a question um, for Commissioner Liberty. Um, 
So during an outbreak um, at the York County Jail earlier um, this fall, it was reported that some jails were not um, requiring inmates and staff to wear masks. And I was just wondering if you could provide an update on that. Are all prisons and jails now requiring um, inmates and employees to wear face coverings? And um, is the Department of Corrections planning to monitor that issue in the future? Sure. Thank you, Evan. That's a that's a good question. Uh, we've been working collaboratively with the um, the main sheriffs and the and the uh, county commissioners and the jail administrators, and um, we've been we've been uh, educating and, and collaborating uh, in uh, conjunction with Doc Shaw and his his team at the CDC. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we've received great cooperation from the uh, county jails. Um, we did do an initial round of uh, courtesy inspections uh, to kind of get a baseline to see where everyone was. And uh, following that, uh, we had a lot of questions, a lot of um, um, cooperation from the county jails. And uh, the first week in November, we'll be returning to the jails to see what kind of progress they've made. Uh, and I'm very optimistic that doing um, everything according to the CDC guidelines. Um, so, so just to be clear, are they, um, is that not yet a requirement for all prisons and jails to have that in place or, or when will that be um, the requirement? Yes, it is, it is a requirement today, and um, they're very clear on uh, the, the recommendations from the CDC and uh, the jail standards that have been implemented, and um, I believe they're compliant now. We're going to confirm that uh, the first week in November. Great. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Amy Brown. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, do the contact tracers ask people if they have recently attended any large gatherings, and if so, are you finding any trends in that? Our case investigators, when they interview new cases of COVID-19, do ask if they have attended any large gathering or small gathering for that matter. Any, they, they, they inquire about any potential avenue through which someone could have been infected. Thus far, what the trend that we have seen has been individuals reporting gathering in small groups. That's where we believe most of the bulk of increase of cases is coming. So have you seen any from larger gatherings recently? I, I'd have to check. We've had hundreds upon hundreds of cases. I'd have to check and see whether if or whether any of those individuals have reported being in any type of large gathering. There's a lot of large gatherings that occur irrespective of whether they are political or others. So we'd have to check. Uh, we don't really define it by the type of gathering. We just inquire as to whether it's a large gathering. Let's be clear. Large gatherings are a risk. No matter what the purpose of the gathering is, if you're going to a gathering, there is an increased risk, and it's a risk that grows more aggressively than the size of the population does. And just a quick follow-up with you, and then I have a question for Commissioner Lambrew, if I may. Is today the, the 80 new cases, is this the largest number? It seems to be the largest number we've had in one day since the beginning of the pandemic. Is that correct? Um, I think it's on par with the numbers that we saw in mid to late May. That's right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Lambert, are you saying that once those rapid tests are available at Walgreens, any member of the public can just go there and pick one up without charge? And will there be a limit or a certain number of times that someone can do that? How's that gonna work? So first of all, to clarify, the test will be administered at these sites is not something you take home. Um, so you will go sell swab at these sites, return the swab to the site, and then the site will let you know if you're positive or negative. Um, we are recommending two uses. Number one is if you are symptomatic. If you have trouble breathing, you have a headache, you have all the symptoms of COVID-19, we recommend that you do get this test because it will potentially rule out COVID-19. If you are positive on this test, we would ask that you go get a PCR test, the other type of test, to confirm that you're positive, but isolate while you're waiting for that test result to make sure that you're not spreading COVID-19. So we do recommend first this use for symptomatic people. We are also though going to begin to test whether we can use it on asymptomatic people who are close contacts of somebody who's confirmed for COVID-19 um, who are also critical infrastructure workers. So we recently heard that the Department of Corrections has at the main state prison and the main correctional uh, center been using these tests on close contacts to rapidly rule out COVID-19 or see who needs a confirmatory test as a very effective means 
to try to quickly make sure that people are not interacting when they could be spreading COVID-19. And so you're looking at that in terms of like how many tests that ends up using or what are, what are you looking at with that element of it? So, and I'll let Dr. Shah talk about this more because we're still learning more about this antigen test. At this time, at this time, we're recommending if you're one of those close contacts who wants to, needs to be able to go back to work because of the critical nature of their job, if they test daily negative, they can return to work for those 14 days they would otherwise be in quarantine. But is that accurate, Dr. Shaw? That is, that's exactly right. This is a way that we hope that more individuals in Maine who work in these critical parts of our economy, critical infrastructure, this is a way that even if they've been exposed, we can help them get back into those critical roles on a daily basis, knowing that their likelihood of exposing anybody is very low. And who can apply for the allocations in advance? So we're allowing any organization in Maine who is qualified to do that if they're not already getting those tests from the federal government. So you have to have a special type of certification to be able to administer the test. You have to go through our training. You have to commit to reporting and reporting to individuals and to Maine CDC uh, the results, as well as ensuring that people understand the results. So there are some, some qualifications but the application is going to be available today to organizations. It could be schools. We're working with the emergency medical system so they can be testing first responders. We are looking at hard to get to areas. Maybe islands are a good site for these tests, um, places where it's not that easy to get tested. So we are open to any applications with, again, a prioritization towards those organizations who can test high-risk people, test in high-risk settings, and provide access where there might not otherwise be access to COVID-19 testing. Great, thank you. Uh, Charlie from the BDN. Yep, hi, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, I guess this is, well, this may be a question for either of you. Uh, still on the antigen testing, uh, I think at one point we had gotten an announcement from the federal government that uh, listed that these tests will be available for various purposes, but it seemed to sort of emphasize schools. And I think Dr. Shaw or maybe Commissioner Lamber, you had also at one point said that might be an emphasis. Is that still, um, are schools still a focus of this program or is it more general now? Yes, we did do a survey of uh, all school school nurses to find out their interest in these tests. We heard some interest, some schools have school-based health clinics, other on-site settings where having this type of test on hand will quickly rule out COVID-19 if a kid or a staff member comes into that nurse's office to see because they're not feeling well. We also have heard that some schools don't have the setup to do it. They're a little bit nervous about parents sending kids to school to be tested. So some schools have, have not been as interested but the great news is that with this partnership with Walgreens, schools can make choices. They can see, do I need to have this test on site in my school or do we have another site nearby where we can send teachers, send staff, send parents as needed. So we're hoping with the information we put out there today, we'll give choices. It also may be the schools partner with local pediatricians or other health clinics to be able to do this type of testing. We agree with the federal government that having rapid testing to help keep teachers and keep kids in school or to keep people with COVID-19 out of schools, it's a very high, great use of this test and we in name embrace it. Great, thank you. Uh, and another question is about the um, sort of tangentially related to the appearance by Donald Trump Jr. Have, okay. Has Maine DHHS in the way that it reached out to this Herman business and apparently the Orrington Church as well. Uh, has it done that before uh, to any businesses or places that have announced that they're holding large gatherings? Have you preemptively sort of uh, contacted any of them? Yes, on numerous occasions, be it weddings, uh, memorial services, uh, sports leagues, we have on numerous occasions when we have heard about events that could be out of compliance or could pose risk to the public, we have reached out in this way. We also have been reached out to um, many types of large gatherings ask, how do I do this safely? Because our whole goal here is not to say no, is to say, 
how you can do so safely. Yes, this way, not no. And our hope is that you can continue to do all these things that are important to people, be it going to a house of worship, going to school, going to a political rally. We support people engaging, but we urge them to do it safely because we're at this very dangerous time when COVID-19 is spreading. So those public health measures are extra important right now. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I have a question about the 12 cases among inmates at the Maine Correctional Center um, in Wyndham. Commissioner Liberty, you said that there is a requirement that masks are worn. Do you know to what extent at that correctional center, uh, to what extent masks were worn and whether that contributed to these cases? So the, the Maine Department of Corrections, like many organizations across Maine, is, is seeing an increase in, in COVID cases. And uh, last week we had two individuals, two staff that uh, were symptomatic and uh, tested positive. And since that time, over the last uh, week, we've been universally testing the staff and, and we now have six that are positive. Um, through symptomatic um, um, residents in our facility that were tested also, we have, uh, we have 12 now um, that are residents. And so man, the, the, we, the wearing of face covering is mandatory. It is enforced. Um, we've done contact tracing and uh, we're still, still working on trying to identify exactly how it, uh, it entered in, into the facility. It could have come through many different ways, but we work very hard at um, uh, requiring face masks, um, requiring uh, enhanced hygiene, social distancing, all of the things that are recommended by, by uh, the CDC, we follow aggressively. We've done extensive planning and programming and training, and we've done uh, an awful lot of work to keep uh, COVID out of our facilities, and uh, we're still doing that. And Dr. Shaw, that's not technically considered an outbreak? At the Maine Correctional Center, we, we have opened an investigation, uh, an outbreak investigation, partly to continue the assistance that and the partnership that we've been providing and offering to the Maine Department of Corrections. And do you have anything to add about any factors that may have contributed to the spread? At this stage, where we are with this is making sure we are able to work with DOC to conduct the testing that Commissioner Liberty noted so we can get a sense of where people are in the facility where they may have, uh, where they are literally, physically, geographically within the facility, that will help us try to get a sense of potential ways it may have entered. Uh, that's really our focus on the investigation front, and then continuing to work with Commissioner Liberty and his team on any other public health guidance or support they may need, specifically around the testing. Thanks. If I could ask one other quick question, Dr. Shaw, you recommended that um, we shorten the duration of indoor visits. Can you give us a time frame that you recommend? Yeah, it's, it's very, it, there's not a hard and fast timeline. Uh, what we know is that in general, the two factors that drive the risk of transmission of COVID are the duration of an event and the density of people in that room, in that restaurant, wherever it may be. There's not a hard and fast timeline. Uh, so I, it's not as if over X number of minutes or under Y number of minutes is more risky or less safe. What we know is that if it's possible to shorten visits in any way and not linger and not prolong visits more than you may otherwise need to, that's the preferred approach. But no, there's not a hard and fast uh, rule. What we do use is what constitutes a close contact. And close contacts are defined as folks who have been within six feet of another person for at least 15 minutes. So as you can see right there, Patty, it's difficult to have a dinner with friends in under 15 minutes. So any type of gathering that's occurring in a home, whether it's dinner around the table or hanging out and watching a movie is likely to be longer than 15 minutes. And thus that gathering right off the bat is one where if there were COVID-19, we would wanna know how long people were together. And when we saw that it was an hour or two, we would say everyone there is a 15 is a close contact. So if you had to have a, a gathering, making it shorter than 15 minutes is the safest thing. But I say that recognizing that that is very difficult to do and still socialize and not go into isolation and risk all of the mental health challenges that we know come from. Thank you. Hmm? Uh, next up is Jay Mishkin at WGME. Oh, good afternoon, thanks. 
Uh, when we look at what's happened at some of the colleges across the country, uh, we notice that many schools seem to have done a pretty good job keeping numbers fairly low. Obviously, there are some instances, but by and large, they've been pretty low. Um, is there any concern that uh, given the rise in community transmission that that's now going to spread to any of our campuses? It's a risk, Jay. Um, what, we, what we've seen is that it goes both ways. There have been now papers that have, and scientists who have studied the interplay between college campuses and the communities in which they sit. And some of those early papers have shown that transmission can go both ways. High numbers of cases on college campuses can sadly spill over into the community and vice versa. One of the reasons that Maine's colleges and universities have kept a lid on things is because they followed the best public health guidance. Maine CDC has worked in concert with most all of the colleges and universities in Maine to, uh, up, to stand up strong testing, rapid identification of those who are positive, and then working with the colleges to make sure that those students are safe and in isolation to limit any transmission. But as cases go up across the state, there is the possibility that that will spill over into college campuses. That's one reason that those colleges, keeping up what they've done already, creating a culture of mask wearing, creating a culture of physical distancing on campus, those are going to continue to be the best ways to keep the rates and numbers in Maine low. Great, one quick follow-up. And if you answered this earlier, I apologize. Just tell me and I'll listen because I jumped in late. Are you satisfied with the preparations uh, for Tuesday that uh, from a safety perspective, uh, poll workers and people going to the polls are gonna be safe? What I can tell you, Jay, is that the main CDC, the main DHHS has worked very closely with the Secretary of State's office and Secretary Dunlap personally to make sure that all of the best available public health science has been brought to bear to keep election day as safe as possible. We will continue to do so every single minute up until and through election day. Thanks. The final question for the afternoon goes to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, just have a, a few clarifying questions. That hopefully, it, I don't think they'll take very long. Um, just to clarify on the antigen testing, is, is there anybody going to Walgreens, they can get a test the antigen test uh, under the standing order, is that right? Yes, okay. and I should note, uh, beginning yeah. in November, they're not yet open for this kind of testing, so give us a little not bit more. Not yet, right. Yes. Right, um, and, and I think I heard you say self-swab, so even though they're not take-home tests, you'll be administering the swab yourself as opposed to a Walgreens employee, is that correct? Yes, under supervision. Mm -hmm. Under supervision, okay. Yes. And could you um, explain, I think it would be helpful to give an example of, I know you were saying that this would help uh, like essential workers, uh, like teachers, uh, healthcare workers, et cetera, get back to work um, it, from a test, but, but can you explain um, how this would, like un explain the timeline a little bit and how you could get back to work sooner than a, a 14 day quarantine because I know like just getting one test doesn't mean you can go back to work right away. So can you explain that a little bit? Sure, Joe, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because in general, as a general matter, if you have been exposed to somebody with COVID-19, say, I don't know, at an indoor gathering at your friend's house, just to use an example, um, and you were with them for more than 15 minutes within six feet, you are considered to be a close contact and under US CDC recommendations with Maine CDC adopts, you gotta be in quarantine for 14 days. Even if you got a test, in general, we have said, you can't test your way out of quarantine. That's because the test you took today doesn't really tell you what's gonna to happen tomorrow. But with the advent of the rapid antigen tests, we now have an opportunity to test people not just once and get a result 48 hours or 24 hours from now, but test people on a periodic, serial, frequent basis, maybe even every day, and get a result not 24 hours from now, but in 15 or 20 minutes, ideally. That gives us knowledge about not whether you're gonna be infectious two days ago when you took the test, but literally the minute you're taking the test at the, at the, play, at the location. 
That allows us to say with a high degree of certainty, because of the critical role that you are providing, you can be on the job wearing PPE, so long as you don't have symptoms, with a low likelihood of introducing COVID-19. That process may have to be repeated on a frequent basis, maybe every day. As we learn more, it may scale back to three or four times a week. More data are going to be needed. But that's the idea, and that's the way that we hope those who work in critical infrastructure can be back on the job. For example, some of Commissioner Liberty's correctional officers as a way to reduce the likelihood of labor shortages in the correctional system. This is a way that they could be back on the job without having to be out for that full two weeks. This is something that Commissioner Liberty's team and the team at the Maine CDC have been discussing as a way to make sure that there can still be safety and adequate staffing at the correctional facilities. I've talked to Commissioner, we talk to Commissioner Liberty's team every single day about COVID-19 and particularly this opportunity. Uh, Commissioner, if there's anything more that you wanna weigh in from an operations perspective, either Commissioner. I think in a correctional setting, these tests have been a, a game changer for us in order to uh, maintain safety and, and uh, security in our correctional settings and I deeply appreciate the relationship that we have with the Department of Health and Human Services and CDC and, and the two of you on on the, um, this call today so thank you both very much Great. I just want to I just want to make sure I understand it's it's a little hard to, to follow all at once so you're saying if you get a, a rapid test even if you just get one test, uh, the, because uh, you're seeing results immediately versus a day or two in the past, that that means you might be able to go back to work that same day or the next day. Correct, Joe, with a couple of really important qualifications. The first is that you have to be asymptomatic. If you are a close contact of somebody with COVID and you now have symptoms, you're a probable case. So you have to be asymptomatic. You've got to be not just tested once, but in serial fashion, so we're keeping tabs on the virus every single day. And even if you may be going back to work, you've gotta have PPE on, a face covering, a face shield, and other PPE as recommended by the main CDC case investigator. So it doesn't apply to everybody. It's really those in critical infrastructure positions with those provisions. Got it, thank you. Okay, great. Well, that was the last question. Commissioner Liberty, Commissioner Lambrew, I'll turn it over to you both for any closing comments. I'll just say we're so excited to have this new layer of testing to complement our existing testing for COVID-19 in Maine. As a reminder, we do have a standing order. Anyone in Maine can get tested. If you have symptoms, if you have been in contact with somebody, if you've been at a large gathering and you think that there could have been somebody there who might have been spreading COVID-19, Go to Keep Maine Healthy. We have a list of sites where you can find out where you can get tested. These tests at these Swabinsons are for free. The same when these new rapid tests come online, you will not have to pay for it. It's just one tool in addition to wearing that face mask, staying six feet apart, being vigilant. As Governor Mills said yesterday, doubling down on our protections now more than ever given the spread of COVID-19 in Maine. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Lambert. Commissioner Liberty, anything on your end? Just like to say that the, the collaboration and the hard work of the people that work in the, the main department of corrections and in the county jails is critical to the success that we've had thus far. And uh, they work hard every day and my hat goes off to all the work that they do and the folks do at the CDC. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Liberty. And thank you all for tuning in this afternoon to hear the latest on COVID-19 across the state of Maine. We appreciate your, your attention to this important matter. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, please be kind, take care of one another. We'll talk again soon.